a big milestone episode tonight for uh, Jack. Uh, it is the 10th episode of the Paradox of Sports. Uh, 10 weeks in a row we've been doing this, and uh, we've had some uh, successes and some screw-ups, but we're learning as we go. So uh, 10 weeks now, Jack. Uh, how do you think it's going so far? Um, it's going pretty well. I mean, I never expected us to do this good. Nice. What's been your favorite part so far? Probably just meeting the – we're overall talking about sports and what I have to say. But I also like meeting some of the other people that we interview. Is there anything about the guests that uh, – is there anything that you that you had been expecting or anything that you kind of were not expecting – as you've done like the first five or six interviews here? I was expecting it to be the, our guests to be not too famous, but our guests were actually pretty well known, say Carl Mecklenburg and some others. So that's been the part you've enjoyed most is just kind of the, the getting to talk to people and the, the notoriety that they have. Yes. Have you learned anything? from the research you've done, like from when we first started to tonight's guest uh, is Dalton Reisner, which is the, 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 the biggest one we've done so far, I think. Um, have you learned anything or have you changed kind of how you've done research and stuff for uh, finding questions for people? I've changed. I have definitely changed my research. I uh, start off with questions I find from Wikipedia and some other websites. Then I help with, and then I get help from my dad, the producer. Uh, he helps make up the final question. Gotcha. So you kind of, you do your own research and you're jotting stuff down. And then you kind of bounce ideas off your dad. And he's done an interview or two back in the day. So then he kind of steers you straight. And then uh, I think you've done well uh, from the first one there with Morgan uh, through this one tonight with Dalton on how you have structured your questioning uh, maybe more chronologically. And then, uh, oh, there's another one we have canned. I think it was with uh, uh, Ringlesby where – he kind of jumped ahead a little bit and you picked right up like two questions ahead and moved forward. So I thought that was, I thought that was something that, that uh, it's just seen that, that you've got more comfortable with and stuff kind of moving forward. So I like that you're getting more comfortable. I like that you're having fun. So I think uh, this is something we're going to be able to do for a little while. Yeah. So the last week I, uh, we took a little vacation uh, the whole family, we went to Scottsdale and did some hanging out with all of our family. So have you kind of had the chance to uh, get away and do any fun uh, here kind of at the start of the summer? Not that I can remember. The last time we went out of state is that when I was at my um, grandparents' uh, house in New Mexico. Okay, so what is what is a what is a, a weekend getaway at the grandparents in New Mexico? Like, what are you what are you doing when you're down there? It was the, so it was a full week, and I basically just go. I basically ride my Ranger down Juniper Canyon, which is about a ten mile drive. Um, I shoot my uh rifle, and by the way, I won twenty dollars for that. Uh, and we were supposed to go fishing and, uh, having a picnic, but the winds were just too strong. Yeah. The winds have been crazy. I know the, the coming home, I flight, uh, I flew, uh, from Phoenix to Denver, Denver to Gillette. I was on the plane with the lady. Uh, I don't want to guess her age. She was older. We'll say that in case she's older. watching. She was older. She, uh. It was the first time she'd ever been on an airplane in her life. And that flight from Gillette or from Denver into Gillette, uh, it was one of the more rough, one of the more rough flights I've had on one of those smaller jets. And this lady was actually, 
they were just dropping us off here in Gillette and she was going to carry on to Sheridan, which is about a 15 minute flight. Uh, she got off the plane and made her family come get her in Gillette. She would not get back on that plane. So she, she wanted nothing to do with uh, getting on an airplane and she let us know she would never get on an airplane again. So kind of ruined that lady's, uh, the wind kind of ruined that lady on air travel, I think probably for the remainder of her life. So when you're, uh, when you're vacationing and you talk about the Ranger or the rifle or whatnot, when you're, uh, when you're down there, what is your favorite thing to do? Uh, probably, uh, probably shoot the rifle because I've been a, uh, an amazing shot pretty much all my life. Okay. And, so you're a marksman. And I like, uh, riding the, um, riding in the Ranger, but the reason that send it not as my favorite was because I got, I got scratched in the arm and I had a, uh, scratch right here by a plant that wasn't even supposed to be sharp. Okay. It was like one of those, it was like one of those trees with like those yellow bead thingies. Okay. And it got you. Yeah. Okay. Now the last week of wrestling was there any big news or anything major happened uh, on the wrestling front? Um, well, nothing really. I mean, for the, when, uh, so it's got, it's got going to be Daniel Bryan versus AJ Styles on Friday for the finals of the Intercontinental Championship Tournament. Um, the biggest one was NXT TakeOver, which held its NXT TakeOver in your house event. I never before seen a thing. First time ever. And it featured some of the some of my personal favorite matches, including Adam Cole versus Velveteen Dream in the uh, backlot brawl. Um a triple threat match to find the new NXT women's championship. And North American title, Keith Lee versus Johnny Gargano. And they and those matches were pretty cool. Nice. So they're still putting on some good some good entertainment. Still no word on when they're gonna get to go uh, in front of a crowd yet. They already have uh, small crowns of NXT superstars for Raw and SmackDown and NXT superstars not in action for the NXT crowd. Okay, so they're getting a little people. Are those in the crowd? Are they reacting to what they see like the normal crowd would be? Um, uh, I, I believe so. I mean, it's a way smaller crowd, only about 20 to 30 people. And uh, they're fenced off by uh, some of that bulletproof glass, you know? Or at least I think that's what it is. And, um... And, well, the viewing experience probably isn't the same, but the reaction to it is very similar. Nice. Cool. Well, one of the things we talked about last week was just something to discuss a little bit more before we got into our interviews. And we we're going to talk about kind of what we miss most right now here, leading out of spring into summer, uh, kind of what we haven't been able to do the most so what is it uh what is it for you that you're really missing right now that you're not getting to do um it's definitely baseball because we were supposed to be in the middle of our baseball season right now i mean i could be away playing a baseball game right now instead of doing this podcast and um and it just isn't there we're gonna start i believe in mid-july so we'll have a, a smaller season what but, do you like or what do you miss the most when you talk about baseball it's i mean looking back what i remember is you know you got together and you had your practices and then kind of when you go to games i think you have a little different experience because when your guys are playing your games uh, there's traditionally like games before you and games after you, right? Um, uh, yes. So you're kind of gathering at a complex where 
there's going to be uh, kind of a larger crowd, more friends and, and stuff like that. Definitely. That's Got you. exactly so, how you explain it. So it's, you're kind of missing just the, the camaraderie of being around people and, and warming up and getting ready for the games and just all that fun. Yeah. That's basically what I miss. Well, I hope we get back to it, man. I hope here mid-July it'll be nice and warm. So that'll be good baseball weather. You guys can you can get back and get to going. So we uh, we did the Reisner interview. That's what we're gonna uh, get ready to play. You uh, you've had about a week to think about it. There, how did you uh, what did you think about the stuff he had to say, and how did you think that one went? Uh, that one was definitely one of our best interviews so far. It was a fluent interview. He had a lot to say. Uh, we were loaded with questions. So overall, the thing took about 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, and um, it was a great experience for me. He was very cool. Um, yes. We're, we're not going to give names. Uh, we have had one individual that, that we did an interview with that I don't think was uh, – uh, if he didn't want to do it, he shouldn't have agreed to do it. Uh, I, I hope that didn't discourage you too much. We talked about it a little at the end after that that gentleman had got off. But Reisner is a – he could not have been more cool. So I think that's kind of what people are going to see. And uh, he's a he's a good dude. Uh, he's a Colorado dude, and uh, I, I think I'm going to have to get me a Dalton Reisner jersey, to be honest with you. Mm. So, with that being said, should we go ahead and give the uh, formal introduction for tonight's guest? Yes. I wouldn't say formal, but let's give the let's, introduction. Let's do it Jack's way. Yeah. Introducing... Co-offensive lineman of the year for the Big 12. Introducing Broncos offensive lineman, Dalton Reisner. Man, pleasure to be on here. Cool, as we always do, uh, to get everything started, we're going to go ahead and toss it to our boy Jack. <coughs> Excuse me. You are from Wiggins. What was your high school experience like in a small community? I am from Wiggins, so my high school experience was – you know, one of a kind and how I view it, Jack. Yeah, I come from a town that there's 800, maybe a thousand people in the town, no stoplights, you know, maybe one restaurant. And, you know, growing up, I got to be raised on a dairy farm. Uh, you know, I worked in the fields and really learned what work ethic was about. You know, I rode bulls and horses and was just raised in a great, you know, atmosphere in Wiggins, Colorado. And when I got to high school, I believe that where I was raised in Wiggins truly built me into who I am today. It built my work ethic. It built my morals. Um, everything about me, I believe, comes from how I was raised with my two amazing parents and my brothers and the Wiggins community. So I think that where you're raised and where you come from can shape you in a lot of ways, um, but it surely doesn't, uh, you know, define you in any way. Yeah. So coming from Wiggins, which is a small town, as you said, wouldn't you coming from Wiggins, come from the small town of Wiggins, coming into the NFL, that would be – that is so amazing that it, it kind of seems like a, fic, a, fiction, a fictitious story to me. <laughs> yeah, well, I really appreciate that, man. It seems like the same to me. You know, I was the first one to be able to have the opportunity to play Division One football out of Wiggins, and it does seem like a fake story. It almost seems like a fairy tale that you see on TV uh, or a movie or something. But, you know, that doesn't come from just me. I think it comes from a lot of my hard work and my dedication and my passion. But – it comes from two parents that supported me and gave me every opportunity in the world to become what I wanted to do. Um, it comes from a, a community and a support system that believed in me. Uh, it comes from, you know, my brothers and people in my life that just, you know, believed in me the whole time. So there's a lot of, a lot of pieces to the puzzle, but it definitely is a crazy story and it almost does seem fictitious, but you know, we made it happen. And, and, you know, I was once the kid in the nosebleeds eating chicken tenders, watching the Broncos, but now I'm the guy out there playing ball. What was it like there in Wiggins when you talk about being the first D1 kid to play football? When did it, when did it kind of dawn on you or, or the community and the coaches in the school that, that you had the eyes on you? Because I assume we're, we're both 
Uh, Jack and I's family is both from Southeast Colorado, real, real small communities. So when, uh, when the kid starts getting the, the D1 folks sniffing around, it becomes a big deal. What's kind of the first experience you had with that, that you remember someone coming around that, that you had the chance to go play big time college football? Yeah, you know, when I was a, a young and uh, I told everyone I was going to be in the NFL someday. And there's a lot of people that told me I was going to do it. And it kind of just became this thing that was in my head. Like, I'm going to make it happen, no matter how crazy it seems to a lot of people. You know, I said I was going to make it happen. And whenever I got to eighth grade, I started going to 10, 15 camps a summer. And I started getting a little bit of recognition from people. And I think that the whole community saw the work I was putting in and how big I was and how well I was playing. And they kind of saw it coming um, for me and my family. You know, we didn't give a lot of attention for a long, a long while. And, you know, a lot of coaches told us that we would never play Division One football. But it just came with perseverance and hard work and, and dedication and resiliency um, to chase that dream. And that's exactly what we did. So I'd say that it hit home one day when I walked into the principal's office and Stanford's offensive coordinator w was sitting down in a fur coat with national championship ring on his finger. And I said, wow, you know, that guy – flew to Denver and drove an hour and a half east to Wiggins, Colorado, and is sitting in the principal's office of this 1A high school football um, school. And, man, that meant so dang much. You know, that meant so much for me. But I also want that mean to, to mean a lot to the community. And um, I think that's what it really sank in. And, uh, you know, to be frank with you, the whole community just always supported me. You know, a couple people here and there didn't believe in me, but I like to focus on the positive. So, I think everyone believed in me the whole time. We all knew it was possible, but when coaches and teams started coming to Wiggins, that's where it, that's when it really sank in. And that's crazy that it took a coach from Stanford to come out to get you in the principal's office for the first time. Like that's <laughs> that's what's awesome, man. <laughs> that's great, man. I won't say that I was perfect, but I did try to stay out of there as much as I could. Yeah, we all do. All right. Um so, along with football, you were also a basketball player and threw the shot put, where you placed fifth in the state. How much did you enjoy these sports? You did some research, man. I like it. You know, I'm not very proud that I got fifth uh, in, in shot put. I wish I would have done better, but shot put and discus was fun for me. Uh, you, you, you didn't see on there that I ran the two mile, did you, Jack? Oh, actually, I did not. I'm just kidding. I didn't run the two mile, man. I would have died before I could run two miles. Um, but no, I really, I really enjoyed those sports. I love basketball so much, to be honest with you. Basketball has always been my favorite sport. Um, you know, with only being six five and weighing 300 pounds, like, you know, to play the position of a center, uh, division one basketball or whatever division, I probably would need to have a few more inches on me and be a little more athletic, but I loved all the sports. I was always a three sport athlete. So I enjoyed them all, but football was God's plan for me. And that's the plan that I rode with. Hey, before we move on to the K-State stuff, you mentioned earlier about riding the bulls and stuff when you were younger. Uh, at what age – you had to have grown out of your bull riding figure at about 10 years old? Like, at what Yeah, I, start, I started when I was like 9 or 10. It lasted a year. And, okay. Uh, yeah. You know, my feet were almost grazing the dirt by the time – by the steers that I was riding, man. And with how much I weighed, you have to have balance. I was bigger than most PBR bull riders at age 10. So, yeah, it didn't last long. Got that. That's what I figured. So you went to Kansas State to play football. What made you decide to commit to KSU? A lot of reasons. I'd say that whenever someone's trying to find a school, there's always going to be an it factor. Um, I had a wise man tell me one time that you don't pick a school for the coach. You don't pick a school for people that are there or what the town looks like, whatever it is. You pick a school – on somewhere where you know you can be happy every single day, no matter the circumstance. And I met with my parents, bud, and I visited a ton of schools, and I just believed there was the place I felt like I could be happy every single day. It was within six or seven hours from my home, so I knew if things didn't go well, I could always head home to see mom and dad. Um, I loved the coaching staff. I loved the town and the restaurants and, and the way the community made me feel. It reminded me a lot of my small town of Wiggins, but just a little bit bigger of a city. Um, I love the way the football program was run. You know, it was run like a blue-collar program where you got to come in and work for what you want. We weren't flashy, you know, and I respect it a lot. You know, Coach Snyder was a coach that I truly believed would turn me into a better friend, a better teammate, boyfriend, husband, father, son, whatever you want to name it. I believed that he would really convert me into who I wanted to be. And that's exactly what he did. So I could talk about reasons on and on, but 
when I left that campus, I just had an it feeling factor that I never had anywhere else. Were there any other universities that you considered? You said when Stanford's coach came in, that was probably one of them, right? Yes, it definitely was. So I'd say Stanford, Missouri, Arizona State, Kansas State. Um, those were amongst some of my favorite offers, um, you know, and I, I didn't really take time to take a look in other, other schools. You know, I love Kansas State so much it made it easy, but, you know, Missouri, Stanford, Arizona State, and Kansas State were probably my top four schools at the end of the day. Okay. So, uh, at KSU, you started 50 of 51 games. Why didn't you start that other game? Dang, man, you're bringing up all sorts of dirt on me, man. Come on, Jack. Sorry. <laughs> it's all good, buddy. So I tore my labrum. Labrum is what keeps your shoulder in the socket. And I don't know if you know what a labrum is, but you have this shoulder bone and there's a little gel-like, you know, whatever you want to call it, bubble around your shoulder that keeps your shoulder from dislocating. I cut a guy from OU. Um, it's like Ornawakpo or something. He ended up getting drafted. He's playing in the league now. I think he plays for the LA Chargers. But I cut him. Um, in terms of like on a pass play and he hit his knee right on my shoulder. I felt it pop. I actually played through it the rest of the year, didn't think anything of it. And my whole junior year, my shoulder would dislocate two or three times a game and I'd have to put it back in. Sometimes it'd go back in by itself. But I had no labrum to keep my shoulder from going in and out of place. And as an offensive lineman, it was tough. Um, I wanted to leave early for the NFL. Um, that was my full expectation and my goal. Um, with an injury, it's a huge red flag in the NFL. So I decided to stay back. So what happened was is I finished up my junior year and I wanted to make sure I had a really good senior year. I wanted to make sure that I could do everything I wanted to my senior year. I wanted to be a part of off-season workouts. You know, off-season workouts at Kansas State, we really get after it. And you build a lot of the leadership in those workouts and it's a huge team bonding. You know, the whole school leaves, but for the summer, it's just the football team there. And we just work out every dang day. We have weekends off, but you build a lot of, a lot of camaraderie in the summer. So anyways, I didn't want to miss that. So I skipped the Cactus Bowl, which was the bowl game um, of my junior year. And I didn't play in the Cactus Bowl. So right after the season was over, I got surgery. And there was four weeks leading up to the Cactus Bowl that I got to heal and recover and get a month ahead of recovery. So instead of coming back for camp my senior year, I got to come back for summer workouts and be a part of that program. So you talked about earlier on the kind of knowing when you, when you had the colleges sniffing around. So then when you're at K-State and you talk about wanting to, to kind of know when you were going to leave early before the shoulder, when did you realize there at Manhattan that you could go to the next level? And then how does your thought process change for getting yourself ready for that step? Yeah, you know, I had NFL agents call me after my sophomore season. I'll vividly remember it. It was CAA. I was actually on my way to go watch Kansas State basketball upset KU basketball um, at the Octagon. And, you know, I was about to make my way over there, and I got a call. I decided to answer it for some weird reason. And they said it was CAA Sports, who's actually one of the biggest sports agencies in the world nowadays. And they said that they wanted me to leave after my sophomore year. They, they believed that I could leave after three years. Anyways, um, when they gave me a call, that kind of just – and I'll be real honest with you, Kevin. I – I didn't think the NFL, you know, I've always believed in myself, but I didn't, I didn't know it was going to be that real that quick. And I got that call. I always remember calling my parents being like, holy cow, like this is becoming a real thing. It's not like some small agency called me. This is one of the big dogs. And wow, that just kind of kickstarted everything for me and told me like, wow, this thing's really happening. And ever since then, you know, I had it on my mind. I wanted to be a first round draft pick and I fell short of that. And, uh, you know, went second round, which I'm very grateful for, but yeah, you know, I'd say that that kick-started the whole feeling. And ever since that call, you know, I had even more belief in myself and I wanted to make it happen. And we had Morgan Fox on here. He went to uh, CSU Pueblo, which that's where uh, Jack's at, his dad that you met earlier. That's where he went to college. That's, that's one thing that I'm very interested in is the agent selection process and how that works and how the school helps you. He talked about his – his, his meetings with his parents and doing that, I assume for you, they, they were seeing dollar signs if they're, if they're calling you when you're a sophomore. How does the process for a, a 20, 21 year old young man go when you're picking an agent? That's a, cause that's a big deal. 
Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a huge deal. It, you know, these guys, you're not dumb. I think the biggest thing to realize is that these guys are contacting you because they want to make money. That's how they keep their job. That's what they're based off of. Um, they're not hitting you up because they think that you're a good guy. They think that you're going to make them some money. But, you know, a lot of these agents do a heck of a job. Sorry if my camera just went out real quick. But um, the agents do a, you know, a heck of a job. So when they called, I got my parents involved right away. My parents are, you know, people in my life that are my role models, people that have believed in me my whole life. So I got them very involved. We got to the point where my dad was doing the selection process. He was going to field all the calls because I was trying to focus on ball. I wanted to play football and I wanted to have a good career. And I didn't want my teammates to think that I was sidetracked with the NFL. I wanted them to know I was con concerned about winning a big 12 championship. Um, so my dad fielded all the calls and he came with the top five. And then I got to talk to the top five and decide who I liked. So it was a really cool process. We had over 250 agents call. I think there's close to a thousand registered agents, but I'll always be thankful for my dad doing that on top of his work. And, and we, we were interested in different things than a lot of guys. We didn't care if you had Peyton Manning as one of your guys. We didn't care if you were going to throw money at us or whatever that was. We wanted people that really cared about me. And someone that if I had never played football again, they would still look after me. And someone that would have my best interest and have my same beliefs in terms of Jesus Christ and, and areas like that. So our selection process was a lot different, but I believe we handled it really, really well. You know, we didn't want it to get in the way of playing college ball. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we knew that it was an important part of the process. And uh, I ended up going with a place uh, agency called Integrity, Honest and Commitment. Uh, it's called IHC. And I have three of the best agents I could ever ask for, man. So I'm, I'm really uh, the process was stressful, um, but, you know, big decision. So it's important to take – it's important, you know, take it seriously. All right. Um, so when you won uh, the 2018 Co-Offensive Lineman of the Year, who was the other Offensive Lineman of the Year? It was a guy from West Virginia. He was a tackle and uh, – Buddy, I can't remember his name. I think he got drafted in, a late, in the late draft last year. But he was a tackle from West Virginia. I can't remember his name, but he was a good player. And you should, because West, West Virginia is not – that's not a Big 12. But I'll quit, <laughs> I'll quit interrupting, Jack. You got a good – your next question's a good one. Mm -hmm. So you played for the legendary Bill Snyder in college. What was it like playing for him? It was awesome, you know. I, I still text Coach Snyder to this day, and – you know, I look, I look up to Coach Schneider for a lot of other reasons other than football. You know, he teaches us how to treat women and how to handle drugs and alcohol and how to be really good role models in this world um, and how to handle our money and the type of men we really want to become uh, to our families and to our kids and to our wives. And that's where I value so much about Coach Schneider is he gets people prepared for the world. Coach Schneider likes to win football games, but more importantly than that, Coach Schneider wants to get you ready to be a man in this world. And I think a lot of college football coaches lack that. I think all their, their main goal is just to win football games every week. We're all competitive people. That's why we're playing at a college level. But what Coach Schneider did, I was so impressed with, is he managed to really change our lives and let us find out who we were as men. And if it weren't for him, you know, I don't think I'd be near as successful in my off-the-field endeavors uh, or on-the-field endeavors. So I credit him to a lot of that. After a successful college football career, you were the 41st overall pick in the 2019 NFL Draft. Obviously, it must have been a great feeling to be drafted, but you were drafted by the Denver Broncos, basically your hometown team. What went through your mind when you received that call from the Broncos? I was extremely excited, and I was humbled. You know, I, I, when I looked at day two, I really wanted to go day one. I'm a competitive guy. But when I, you know, didn't go day one, I looked at the day two sheet and I wanted to go to the Denver Broncos. And, you know, I got pretty scared that they might not pick me up, but they sure as heck did. John Elway became my boss, you know, number seven, someone that we've looked up to in our household, you know, ever since I was a little kiddo. So that was an amazing feeling, a uh, great homecoming for the Wiggins community and for my family. And I got a house here in Parker, Colorado now, and it just feels so good to, to be a part of this community, be a part of this team, and be living a dream that I had as a kid. And not only living that dream, but living it for the exact same team that I had in mind. So what was the first NFL season like for you? What were some of the learning curves and growing pains that you had from your college days now into the pros? It was a great year, you know, not as successful as we would have liked um, as a Denver Broncos team. 
and not as successful individually as I would have liked. You know, my goals were Pro Bowl and All Pro. Um, and more importantly than Pro Bowl and All Pro it was to win a Super Bowl with the Broncos. So I fell short on all three of my goals last year. Um, I think that I still had a successful year, but I have a lot of room to grow, a lot of areas to get better. Uh, I credit a lot of my success last year to Coach Munchak, who's a Hall of Fame coach, um, and he's a Hall of Fame player in the NFL as well. He's a legend. Um, so I credit a lot to him. He slowed down the game for me. And, you know, even though we fell short of some of the goals, I had a, I had a blast. And I can't wait to play in this league for as long as I can. So another thing I'm curious about with at the NFL level is when you're going against – the defensive guys, who do you like to, 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 to get one over on the most? Back to the, 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 the other kid that we've had on, uh, Morgan, he was the D2 level, and he talked more about where he was undrafted. He likes getting it over on the drafted guys. So where you went second round, is it is it – something you enjoy getting one over on a first round guy is it I thought it would be getting it over on the so-called quote powerhouse guys you know slamming a dude from Auburn slamming a dude from Alabama like who is it that you get one over on that you're like man who do you enjoy beating the most one-on-one yeah you know I don't really care about the conference you can enjoy what conference you were in college and call yourself a powerhouse. But when you get to the NFL, you got to play with the big dogs and you can't refer to yourself as a college player anymore. That's done. So that's definitely something that bugs me, man. If I hear someone say that they're from Alabama or LSU, like, yeah, I'm going to want to go after them even harder. Um, But for me, man, and, and my story, it's every single person, you know, I truly believe that no one expects me to get to where I'm at today. Um, if you would ask people 10 years ago when I was just a little kid eating ice cream at the park in Wiggins, everyone probably would have told you I was never going to make it to the Broncos. Um, and I know that's kind of contradictory to my story, but that's just kind of how I feel. So every time I go out there, no matter who I go against, I have a chip on my shoulder and I want to prove it. You know, I don't, I don't look into who they are. I don't, I don't find out who they are through the helmet. I just know their jersey number and I know that I want to put them on their back. And uh, that's something that drives me and I want to continue to be that way throughout the Throughout my time in the NFL, I don't care if I'm going against a rookie or a 10-year vet. Um, I want to make sure that I have a chip on my shoulder no matter what. Um, I will tell you that if I see Khalil Mack uh, across from me or Von Miller or someone like that, I might have a little more angst uh, to make something crazy happen. But other than that, that's probably it. Um, What was your biggest achievement during your first pro season? My biggest achievement during my first pro season – I would say coming into the Denver Broncos as a second round pick that was expected to play. And from what I know, living up to the expectations that the fan base in Denver had for me and what my coaches had for me um, in my exit interviews, um, I feel like my coaches definitely thought that I went above and beyond what they expected from me this year. And that's a lot of pressure that a lot of people don't think about. They might say, well, you're a second round pick. You just kind of got to come in and be the starter. I looked at it opposite. Um, I, I was worried sick that, I was a second round pick and everyone did expect me to start. And here I am a kid from Wiggins that went to Kansas state. I had so much to prove and I'm really proud of myself that I stepped in and I started at a professional level. Um, I didn't take me a couple weeks. It didn't take me a couple games. I earned that spot as soon as I got to the Broncos and uh, that carries a lot of weight for me, man. So I just say how I stepped in, I filled the role that the Broncos needed and I did it to the best of my ability for last year. When you talk about your exit interviews and everything that kind of goes on with being a, a professional through your K-State stuff. I, and, and the little bit I've read on, on coach Snyder talks about how he prepares his, his guys that, that want to be prepared for the real world. Was there anything about the NFL and it, as much of a business it is, was there anything that caught you off guard or were you, were you ready for the business aspect of professional football? I don't think you can ever be, you know, ready for that. You know, when you're in college, just a bunch of band of brothers together that are on scholarship checks, living paycheck to paycheck, just balling together on on Saturdays. Um, But when you get to the NFL, you see how quick it's a job. I think I had 10 different locker mates last year. Um, I saw guys that I thought were great players get let go. You know, I've seen guys that were amazing dudes inside their heart. Um, get let go and that doesn't matter it's truly a business you know this isn't to see who the best guy is and keep him on the team because he's been good to us or he's been loyal no it's the best players every single year 
And I'm sure I'll be talking on the same podcast maybe in six years or whatever, telling you guys that I'm an old washed up vet and I'm worried about the ro- rookies coming in. You know, that's just how it goes. And um, you get fine. You know, there's no, there's no dad and mom system. You don't get, you don't get your parents called. You don't get called if you miss something. You're going to get cut or you're going to get fined. And um, that was a shock to me, but I loved that. I was, I was, I'll, tell, I'll be real honest. I was sick and tired of being in college in my fifth and final year. I was sick and tired of having to run for 17, 18-year-old kids that thought it was funny to drink the night before. They thought it, they didn't care if they showed up five minutes late and the whole team had to run. You know, I like this idea in the NFL that we're grown men, we're professionals. And, you know, one, you pay the price for what you do. The whole team isn't going to pay the price. We're, we're, this train is moving forward. And you're either going to get on it or you're not. Okay, I think Jack's got one more. I'm going to ask you my last question. Uh, it's kind of a trivia one, and I left my sheet, so I don't even know the answer, but we can check the tape. How many names or guys can you name that are on the, Bron- the Broncos Ring of Fame around the stadium? <laughs> oh, shoot. Well, I'd say John Elway definitely is one. I'd say Terrell Davis. And I might not be saying all of them. I'm just going to tell you guys I think that's on there. I'd say Shannon Sharp. Shannon Sharp, Terrell Davis, um, John Elway, John Lynch, I believe, is on there. Um, I'm going to go with uh, – let me just let me just back this sucker up real quick. I'm going to go with Bishop. Keith Bishop, I think, is up there. I think – oh, um, Maybe Carl Mecklenburg, Steve Atwater. Oh, man. Carl, Mecklenburg, not... Carl Mecklenburg, Carl uh, Mecklenburg, guest on this podcast. <laughs> Albi- the albino rhino, man. The albino rhino. He, yes, sir. I think he's on. I think he's on there, man. Um, I'm really, I'm really. I, there's names going through my head, but I don't want to name anyone that's on there. Um, shoot. I know. I go in the indoor and I look at the Champ Bailey. I know he's got to be on there. Oof. Let's go. Tom Nalen, I think, is on there. He wears a really awesome jersey, number 66, something like that. Yeah, yep. Um, I'm going to just stop there, man. No, know. you're good. That, that, that proves to me that when you're at work, you're focused on work. Yeah. And you're not staring around reading the wall. I'll catch myself. Yeah. Only, I'll catch myself work. I can tell you all the posters and all the stuff on the walls where I work. So that's <laughs> – you're focused on your job. So, I appreciate okay, it, man. Okay, Jack, I got – last one's yours. Okay. With COVID-19, it certainly changed the way that organizations communicate and organize team activities. What adjustments have you and the team had to make prepare had to make to prepare for the upcoming season well you know we're two months late already probably gonna be looking at three months late so we're gonna have to start up for training camp and completely skip all of our OTAs so we haven't been able to work with each other we've had to be working out from home doing virtual meetings and the way we look at it is we're trying to win the virtual battle we're trying to take meetings more serious than anyone else in the country we're trying to focus in on what we need to do better than everybody and we're working out at home, making sure we're eating the right foods. Um, so there's been a lot of sacrifices that we've had to make. We can't be in the facility with each other with COVID-19. We can let alone not even really be at the same house as each other. So it's been really difficult, but we're professionals. We get paid to, to be professionals, so we got to act that way. And whenever it comes to time to play ball in July, we got to just hope that we won the virtual battle as the Denver Broncos. Awesome, man. We appreciate you taking some time to uh, hang out with us tonight. Thank you guys so much, man. It was a pleasure. Cool. Thank you again, Dalton. All right. See you guys. Later. See you. Later.